Lots to talk about in this video. We're going to take a look at wireless, and wireless is just not your wireless router. Wireless can be broken down into different technologies. The three technologies we're going to take a look at are the three that you most likely use on a daily basis, and that would be Bluetooth, cellular, and of course, the Wi-Fi. Beginning with Bluetooth, Bluetooth has become ubiquitous. It's becoming everywhere. For example, I wound up getting a speaker. This is a Bluetooth speaker. It's actually quite powerful for 20 bucks. You charge it, you pair it with your device. I can listen to my music from my phone on the speaker, Bluetooth as well, iPads, Bluetooth. You find Bluetooth everywhere now. It's a great wireless technology. It's fantastic for short range devices. Bluetooth actually comes from an old Danish Viking. That's who we get the name from. So when they developed it, they named it after this guy from way, way, way back in the day. It is designed to connect consumer devices into a PAN, a personal area network. And again, you're finding Bluetooth everywhere. You can get it among cars now. If you buy a brand new car, it's probably Bluetooth enabled, which allows you to sync your phone to it so you can do hands-free communications, all this great stuff. So you can find Bluetooth on your cell phones, your computers, your peripherals, your cars, your telephones, your tablets, and pretty much any other cool gizmo with a chip. How to connect it, it's fairly simple. It's getting easier and easier. I mean, it was easy when it first came out, but it's getting ridiculously simple as we go through and we see more devices with Bluetooth. It's considered plug and play. This is an older term from Windows 95 days where you would just plug something in and it should pick it up without a problem. Connecting a Bluetooth device to something else is called pairing. This is the technical term for it. We pair our devices together. To pair a device, they must be set to discoverable. So for example, when I turn on my speaker, you should be able to see a little blue light flashing. Maybe, there you go, okay. This little blue light is searching for another Bluetooth device. So let me turn this off for a second and I'll show you. I'll take my phone, put the password in. By the way, you should always have a password on the front of your phone. You never know when you're going to possibly lose your phone. So I have my phone right here and I'm going to turn Bluetooth on. So now my phone is on discovery. I'm going to turn the speaker on. and it's connecting they're now connected so if i wanted to put music on my phone for example okay i'm not gonna play too much on by the copyright laws but i have a random mix on my phone from amazon music my phone has the song on it it's playing through this it's been paired together and so i get great sound quality from this 20 dollar little speaker I can also sync up my iPad or what other devices I want to. So it's pretty cool. Um, I'm sure you probably have devices that are Bluetooth enabled. So you have to have one in Discoverable and one in Broadcast and they pair together and you're good to go. Moving on to cellular, also <laughs> busting out the phone again. We're looking at cellular connections. It uses an ultra high frequency radio range, UHF. Cellular comes from how people relate or the phone relates to the base station, they create cells of coverage. The base station is the transmitter and receiver antenna. This is what you're connecting to, to both send information as well as receive information. Base stations have a field that they supply if it's broken and it's broken up into cells. The base stations overlap, but use different frequencies to prevent disrupting signals. So as you're going from one location, let's say you're driving cross country, as you go at the end of one base station, it's going to do a handoff to another base station. So you should have uninterrupted signals. And through the miracle of geekdom, the signal is going to change. The frequency is going to change going from one station to another station. So you don't get any interruption of connectivity and you don't have any problems. Now, there is some unhidden, there is an unhidden thing about cell service, which is uh, not pleasant. But if you've ever been in a place where you've had a natural disaster or a man-made disaster, then you find that the cell towers, there's not enough cell towers, there's not enough base stations to handle all the cell phones in the area. 
they plan on the fact that not everybody's making a phone call at the same time. Case in point, I was up in D.C. when we had that earthquake. This was our very first earthquake I have ever been in. I usually lived in places where you have tornadoes and hurricanes, so earthquake was new to me. Can say, didn't like it. Trying to call my wife, see if she was okay. Trying to get a signal was close to impossible because everybody's making the phone call at the same time. We also have, saw this happen during 9-11. We also see this happen during any massive um, event, any major disaster, where everybody's on their phone and you can't get signals in. So that's a sort of a underside, underbelly of cell phone coverage, which is they require for it to work, not everybody making phone calls at the same time. Which incidentally, if you ever find yourself in that situation, you have more luck sending out a text message because it uses less information to get information out as far as um, if, God forbid, you're ever in a situation where you have a natural disaster and you need to talk to somebody. Frequencies used by cell phone carriers or cellular varies by country. This is not a universal thing. If you are going to go overseas, if you're going to do a lot of traveling, you want to make sure you have something called a world phone, which is able to pick up your frequencies no matter where you're at and able to communicate. Let's say if you're in America or England or Australia or the UK or uh, Ireland or Germany or what other country, you want to make sure your phone can connect to the technology they have. And there's two methods, at least that we use in the USA. You have CDMA and you have GSM. GSM is definitely the most popular standard in the world. Now, a little bit of FYI for you, and I wouldn't recommend doing this, but if you have a GSM phone and you dial 122, in the U.S., this actually connects you to 911. Uh, again, don't try it unless you actually have an emergency. Okay, so we've covered Bluetooth. We've covered cellular. Let's take a look at everybody's favorite wireless technology, and that would be Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi stands for Wireless Fidelity. So now if you ever ask that question on Jeopardy, you now know, and I want some of that money, <laughs> um, uses radio waves. They're good for around 150 feet to 300 feet. The range is not exact. We can use two basic layouts when we talk about a wireless network. We can have something called an ad hoc mode, or we have an infrastructure mode. The ad hoc mode is where you have all your devices connected to each other. It's peer-to-peer, uh, -peer, which we'll talk about at the end of the video. And we have infrastructure, which is more of your networking setup. You're connected to a central device. So again, for example, in my house, we have my iMac, which is wireless, connected to the router. We have my iPad to the router, my phone to the router. All wireless devices connected back to a central hub, which would be the wireless router. There are lots of popular brands for you to choose from. So you go to the big box store and you want a wireless router. You can go with Linksys, D-Link, Netgear, Belkin. They all have very similar setup uh, routines and they're all about the same quality. Now, before I get hate mail from fanboys, sometimes somebody releases a model that's better than the other model. You probably want to look at reviews to pick out which one you want. Of course, price is usually king. So setting up your Wi-Fi. Now pay attention. Let me um, let me take a pause. Drink my drink. Take a deep breath. Let it out. Because this is important if you're using Wi-Fi. Pay attention. If your case you're zoned out. Hello, wave. Hello, pay attention. Setting up your Wi-Fi. To prevent bad people from doing bad things to your Wi-Fi. Things to do. When you set up your Wi-Fi, change your admin name and password. All routers come with default passwords and administrative names. And all it takes is a two-minute search on Google to find out the default administrative name and the default password. And believe me, if somebody is war driving, war driving, which means driving around looking for wireless signals, or you live in an apartment complex, or you live close to somebody, they can steal your Wi-Fi access. And a default administrative name and a default password is the easiest way to do it. I mean, anybody who has any technology background, even if it's an intro course, knows how to do this. So change your admin and your password, the first step. Only allow configuration of the router through a wired connector. Some routers allow you to configure the router wireless, wirelessly via Wi-Fi. 
Others settings you have to be physically plugged into the router. For security's sake, you don't want people hacking into your router and configuring it. You want to be connected through a wire in order to make administrative changes to that router. You also want to change something called the SSID and turn off the broadcast. Let's talk about what SSID is. It's the name of the Wi-Fi network. So you name your network. You can call it anything you want. You can call your network Butafuco, or you can call your network, um, you know, my network. Uh, what's kind of funny, by the way, is while I was working in Virginia, don't forget I used to train FBI folks up there, the cyber guys and the cart guys and DEA. In North Virginia, you can't turn a corner without running into some government installation. The FBI are all over the area, the DEA is all over the area, the intelligence community is all over the area. And more than once, I picked up signals from FBI vans. And they would say FBI vans. Now, some people do this for fun, they goof around. But some people in the FBI, and hopefully they get the message, and if they haven't changed it now, change it in case you're watching this. Don't name your network FBI anything and don't put not the fbi i mean that's not like a red hair you know hello woo, red light there but i would drive around and i would see government installations and law enforcement installations with their ssid the name of the network actually labeled after the organization which is incredibly stupid anyhow off my soapbox so you want to change the name of your wi-fi network from a consumer point of view if a bad guy sees the default name of a network, they are going to come after you because they also assume you haven't changed your default admin or your default password. So change your SSID. Also, there's an option to turn off broadcast. Wi-Fi is funny because they really try to make it user-friendly, but in doing so, they also make it bad guy friendly. Your SSID, your network name, also broadcasts the name. It sends out the name. It says, hey, I'm called Bob. I'm called Joe. I'm called my network. You can change the name and you can also turn off the ability of the network to send out that information. So more or less what happens is you have to know the name of the network in order to even connect to the network. So turn off broadcast. And finally, please pay attention to this. You have encryption. You have your protection on your network. And there are three choices when you set this up. You have WEP, which stands for Wireless Equivalency Privacy. You have WPA, which is Wi-Fi Protected Access. And then you have WPA2. Do not, under any circumstances, use WEP for your network security. You can crack WEP in 10 minutes or less, depending on how good your computer is and how much networking traffic is on there. So somebody could sit out front of your house or somebody could be in your apartment complex. They have a program running on their computer, which are usually free. They can completely bypass your security in 10 to 20 minutes if you're using WEP. Do not use WEP. WPA was kind of a band-aid because of WEP's massive security vulnerabilities. WPA2 is what you should use. It's a massive improvements over WEP. It is currently the wireless security standard. You want to use WPA2. All right, in our next video, hopefully you paid attention for the wireless. In our next video, we're going to start taking a look at some of the more geeky aspects, and we're going to talk about computer networks.